How are we doing today? That's what I'm talking about. It's, uh, I, I got to tell you, and this is actually related to the theme t- today, the scripture, but uh, per, just as on a personal level, I, I love church. I love being in church. I love being with God's people. I love, it's God's idea. It's the church belongs to Jesus. He's the founder and the Lord. And uh, so aside from the fact that I usually drink far too much coffee before I speak, I'm always just jazzed and jacked up to be in church. So it's a good thing. Um, that we have the opportunity. Hey, so, some of you know, and maybe not all, that our church is, is part of a larger family of churches, an association of churches called Transformation Ministries. And uh, so we are one of uh, about right around 200 congregations uh, across the country uh, that have covenanted together to uh, pursue the mission of the church to see that disciples are made. And so uh, one of the reasons that this Thursday night option is great for people like me is that on Sundays I'm often traveling in one of our sister churches. So that gives us the opportunity to continue to worship and be a part of uh, the ministry on a Thursday evening. And so you may also, it may fit your calendar, you may know someone who's not free on Sunday. So a plug for the Thursday uh, evening thing. But the other thing is, as far as the uh, family of churches, is one of the fun things I like to do is when I'm in one of our sister churches, I always tell them, if I know, I say, hey, the next church I'm going to be in is wherever it is. And then I ask them, hey, would you like to send greetings? So last Sunday, uh, we were at Rock Harbor Christian Fellowship in Morro Bay doing a great, great job reaching the community there. And so I said, hey, next week I'm going to be in Anaheim City Church. So can I, may I bring greetings from Rock Harbor to you? And they said, yeah. Three times they did, all three services. So I'm bringing you greetings from Rock Harbor. And, uh, and that reminder to you is that God is at work uh, in ways that you may never see, but the gospel is, is effective and God is working through his church. And it's important that we are part of a larger association of churches because it helps us be faithful to the mission of the church, which is to see the gospel reach the world through our partner churches. So that's a, a great uh, blessing that, that I have and that City Church is a part of. Now this morning, we're going to continue in our, in our series in the Gospel of John. And so we're going to be in John chapter 13 in, in a few moments. So you can start finding your, there, your way there in the Bible that you brought with you or on your phone. You can fire that up to uh, a new version or other web-enabled device or program to get to John chapter 13. We'll be back there in just a moment. Now, we live in a very um, consumer-driven culture here in America and in the Western world. And so, um, and that means that in order for us to get us to buy stuff, you know, advertising is a a finely tuned and finely honed process. Well, uh, in light of the the text, uh, which product placement, let me just, you know, that's part of it, right? Product placement. But in light of our our, uh, um, verse today, I just noticed kind of in a new sort of way, if you walk down, like say a grocery store or any place where there are all sorts of different things you can buy, how many times do you see on the label new and improved? Right? Now, I've been buying that lie for years. How can it be new and improved? You ever think about that? See, I want you to learn something every time you come to church. So I just want you to learn that. It can't be new and improved. Because if it's new, it's new. And if it's improved, it already existed. People, they're leading us down the path. Do you not see it? So I'm thinking, now that's what advertising is all about. Hey, it's new and improved. And we're like, yeah, it must be. Come on, man. How can you do new and improved cornflakes? Cornflakes are cornflakes, man. So we, we get this whole new and improved thing. But the reason this is important, our text today, Jesus says, a new commandment I give you. Now, because we know that Jesus is not into false advertising, and Jesus is not messing around with us or manipulating us, then something's going on here in this text that's really, really important. So I say... Let's find out what it is, all right? So we're going to read in John 13. Before we do that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to be gathered together again today uh, in the name and under the lordship of Jesus, head of the church. Thank you for your word. We are going to open it and continue to read in the gospel of John as we many of us have been now for many, many weeks. Thank you for your word. 
God, as we read it, we pray that you, will, through your Spirit, would speak to us, not just for knowledge, but also for life change and for witness in Jesus. Amen. All right, so John chapter 13. Are you there? In your Bible, on your phone, also, I believe the words will be up here. So uh, we're going to read verses 31 to 35 in the Gospel of John chapter 13. I'll read, you follow along, all right? This is the word of the Lord. When he was gone, that's Judas. When Judas was gone, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. May God bless the reading, hearing, understanding, most important, the doing of his word. Now, in this text, we have, by the way, product placement. Are we on the Facebook Live? So, City Church. I'm a hand waver when I talk, so that bad boy is going to get knocked off of there pretty quick. So, so in this text, um, and in, this, uh, in the Gospel of John, if you're familiar with the Gospel of John and also we call the epistles of John, the, the little letters that the apostle wrote later on to the church, this idea of love, the love of God, loving one another, uh, we are loved by God and therefore we love others, and it's a very prominent theme uh, in the Gospel of John. Uh, as the, the Spirit led him to, to uh, tell us about the life of Jesus. And so uh, it's a very prominent. And the, the fact is, in our society, in the world in which we live, the, the idea of love, there's no shortage of the, the talking about or the thinking about love in, in our world, right? Like, come on, pretty much every popular song is about love in, 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 of some sort, right? Love this, love that, whatever. I want to, you know, I, th I thought about this this week, and I, it could be dating myself a little bit, but come on, Tina Turner says, what's love got to do with it, right? Nothing but a secondhand emotion. See, now some people know real music over here. I'm just what I'm saying. Uh, old people, help me out here, right? Come on, come on, right? So, the, but here's the thing. Most of our thinking, listen, most of our thinking and our cultural values around love are off base in one critical area. You know what it is? We believe that love is a, is a matter of feelings only. And so love, as the Bible teaches it, and in its most powerful reality, love is a choice and a commitment. It is a choice and a commitment. Now, earlier in one of my earlier versions of notes, I, I put here, um, love is not feeling. Well, that's not true because there's, you know, there's a lot of feeling in love, right? You feel love and it's great. There's nothing wrong with that. So I changed it to say love is not just feeling or emotion. Love is not just based on that feeling or that emotion alone, and in our world, in our society, we bought that as a value. If we're not feeling it, it's not love. And I'm just here to remind us that that's not the kind of love the Bible teaches. It's not even the most practical uh, understanding of love. So as a pastor over the many years, I have performed many weddings. And in one of my, and in, in I call it part of my wedding speech that I give to the bride and the groom, and uh, I always say pretty much the same thing to them. I say, I know you're not listening to anything I say right now. And they never are. They're just going. You know, and I tell them at the rehearsal, you're not going to be listening. You don't know what's going on. Just let it go in. You know, I say I do. You say I do, you know. But, I, but this is what I say. But later on, since everything's on videotape, later on, listen to what I'm saying because what I'm about to say is really important. <laughs> and one of the things I say, remind in that context, is that as, as bizarre as the thought might seem standing at the altar in the wedding ceremony, there may be a day where you wake up and you do not feel like you love your spouse. Now, I wouldn't know. I've never experienced that. You know, we had 40 year anniversary this year, right, honey? Yeah, because today's sermon is not online, so I can say that. And I say, on that day when you wake up and you don't feel 
That's when I remind you that what you're doing here is you are making a choice and a commitment called a covenant to love. Are you with me on this? Now, I'm not saying that feeling's not a part of it, but when we buy the lie that if we don't feel it, it's not really love, we really miss very important teaching that, that uh, Jesus is giving us here. Let me ask you this question. In this context right here in the Gospel of John, which, by the way, we're in an amazing part of the Gospel of John. We're in that, those several chapters where Jesus has withdrawn from his public ministry, and now we have privy to what he's talking to his disciples about in private, in the upper room, as they're walking to the garden, in the garden. And we have these, these amazing things where Jesus is teaching about himself and the gospel and about Christianity and the church and the body. And so it's an it's a incredible um, section of the, the life of Jesus and, te- uh, Jesus and the teaching of uh, the gospel. But, and, and in part of that, we have that, that uh, time when Jesus is in the garden praying, the garden of Gethsemane. And there's this, and, and it's recorded for us that as Jesus is in the garden, he's agonizing because he knows what's coming. And he says in his prayer, as John records it, he says to God the Father, God, if it's possible, what does he say? Let this cup pass because I don't feel like being beat to a pulp. I don't feel like being spit on. I don't feel like being shredded. I don't feel like receiving the wrath and judgment of sin on my body and on my spirit. I don't feel that right now. So if love was all about that, Jesus legitimately could have said, therefore, I ain't doing it. But what does he say? I don't feel like this, Lord. Then he goes on to say, but let your will be done because I have already made the choice and the commitment to follow through on your plan. That makes sense, doesn't it? Now, and I'm just simply reminding you and myself too that there is a certain decision, choice, and commitment going on when we're talking about love. And, and, and so when we take it that way, it, t- it takes us into, uh, I call it you know, a lot of less fluff <laughs> and more substance and more of where God wants us to be. Less about being jerked around by, by uh, circumstances and how we feel or what other people say, and, and more uh, into the substance and strength and purpose of life that God uh, has created us for. Now, back to the new part, because Jesus said, I give you a new commandment. Let me just remind you of one small thing. Uh, we, in this uh, passage, we are under authority. Jesus did not say, Hey, a new suggestion I give to you. A new thought I give to you. A new possibility I give to you. Should you decide to love one another? What does Jesus say? This is a new commandment I give you. And so we're under the authority uh, of this uh, command. It's not a suggestion. The second thing about this is that it's not like they had never heard, if they were good Jewish people, it's not like they had never heard this idea of the importance of loving other people before. In fact, in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, in the Mosaic Law, it says that the, a, the good, a good Jew, a faithful Jewish people, were to love their neighbors like themselves. In fact, in another place recorded in the Gospels, when the religious leaders were trying to uh, trip up Jesus, they said, what's the greatest command? Because they were really into following rules, right? They really wanted to know, you know, just tell us what all the rules are and so on and so on. And Jesus says, everything in the law and the prophets is summed up in these two things. What are they? Love God, love your neighbor. Both of those things were already recorded in the Older Testament. So it's not like they had never heard this idea of loving, but Jesus says it's a new understanding. And did I mention Jesus isn't messing around with us and, and, and jerking us around like false advertising? So if he says there's something new, it begs the question, what's new about this command that Jesus gives? And do you know where the answer is? As is usually the case, the answer is in the text. The answer is in the text. You know what's new about this commandment? This is how Jesus says it. Love one another, here it is, as I have loved you. That's the key. That's the new piece. That's the new component. That's not new and improved. That's just new. 
Jesus says, as I have loved you. You are called to that level of love. And when you do that, people will identify you as my followers. So that's the idea of as I have loved you. Now, we'll just kind of look at this in two very basic ways. So this new command of loving as Jesus has loved, we just want to look at it in two very basic ways. And one is uh, what is called both the, the, the pattern of this kind of love and the power in this kind of love. The pattern and the power. Jesus says, as I have loved you. So we're looking at the pattern and then the power of the love. Uh, there's a very influential uh, pastor, thinker, author uh, named John Piper, who is just a, a really exceptional, exceptionally gifted teacher and pastor and written lots of books and so on. Um, and in talking about this very thing, he uses the phrase, uh, he, he says it's about living in Jesus and living on Jesus. Living in Jesus and living on Jesus. So we want to look at the pattern uh, of love and then the power in this new love. All right. So the first is, what, what is this idea of this pattern of loving like Jesus? Well, very simply, it's this. Jesus says, this, the pattern of love that I'm calling you to or commanding you to is to lay aside status, rank, privilege, prestige, and become a servant. That's, that's new. Now, look at the context of what Jesus is saying this. Now, I didn't go back and read all that, but if you look in the context in John chapter 13, Jesus has just done the most mind-blowing thing to his disciples. You remember what it was? He washed their dirty, stinking feet at an official religious banquet at which he was the guest of honor. He was the teacher. He was the rabbi. He is the son of God. And in that context, he took on the form of a servant, took off his, his outer garments, kneeled down, and washed their dirty, stinking feet. And if you don't think they were dirty, stinking feet, you're just fooling yourself. And so in that context, and, and if you read that, they were just like, whoa, this is not right. This is not what should be going on because you're the rabbi, we're not. You're the Messiah, whatever that means. We don't quite understand it, but we're not. So you shouldn't be doing this because you're this and we're not. And so Jesus says, no, 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 you don't understand. In fact, even as he's doing it, he says, do you understand what I'm doing for you? I'm setting aside my prestige. I'm setting aside all claim of my right to be all that. And he had every right. Let's not confuse that. But he laid that aside to become a servant. In fact, uh, the Apostle Paul would talk about this this way in Philippians chapter 2. Uh, again, taking on this same attitude. Remember, Jesus said uh, to love in the same manner. And see, he gave a very practical example of laying aside his prestige and power uh, and, and, and being the most important person in the room and became a servant. The Apostle Paul, Philippians 2, would talk about this is what it looks like for Christians to have this same attitude. Philippians chapter 2, it says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider uh, others better than yourselves. Each of you should not only look for your own interests, but to the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as that who is that of Jesus Christ. And then he goes on in chapter 2 to say that Jesus, even though he was God himself, did not consider that something to be grasped, but set that aside, emptied himself, and took on the form of a servant. And then Paul says, that is what followers of Jesus are called to do. That manner of service, that manner of not claiming any particular special position, but rather considering others before yourself. I have been this week, I came across this, so I'm just really thinking about this passage about esteeming others and, and the struggle that we, we often have. And so I, um, here we go, I uh, found this, it's like a blog or something here. That is a blog, sorry. Uh, and I, I put it on my phone because I, I've been reading it. I've been walking around, I've been reading this thing because I want to uh, keep it uh, fresh in my mind. And as a person who is a, a blog who is talking about practical ways to esteem others higher than yourself. In other words, how in a practical way 
how do we go about just kind of every day in my mind, in my head, in my actions, uh, uh, guard how I look at other people? And so these are amazing, uh, which is, again, like I said, why I just have them on my phone. I've been looking at these all week long. Here, here are a couple. Just listen to these. Number one, uh, don't assume that others have exactly the same evil motives as you find in your own heart. Aye. But rather, put the best possible uh, interpretation on the, act, on the uh, actions of others. Wow. That's, that's a good one. That's a good one for me. Uh, look for virtuous qualities in others that you are in most need of yourself, and then humbly ask them, to help you be more like that. Don't assume that your time, your money, your energy, your thoughts, and your opinions are more valuable than your neighbors. Oh, wow, ouch. When making a decision, consider not only how that decision will affect your interests, but how about the interests of others? Be alert to your own, not just to your own needs, others, that's what the scripture said. Um, And then this one, guard your heart from developing a pattern of critical, condemnatory, and accusatory attitude towards other people. Wow, that's some serious stuff. It's why I've been looking at it all week long. If it weren't so long, I'd turn it into a bumper sticker and sell it. So maybe maybe a poster or something like that would, would, would be good. But these are they're so practical and so real. And the reason that they strike us in such a real, practical way is that uh, in our nat- naturally, we fall into what could be called a transactional relationship. In other words, we look at how we interact with people. As it, the term is called transactional relationships. And, and we all understand this, a transaction. So if you go to a store and you buy something, you have a transaction. I give you this, usually it's money, and you give me this in return. And by nature, we fall into this attitude that the way we treat people, what we do for people, how we act, it's always like, hey, what's in it for me? If I do this, I'm expecting that. What if there's nothing in it for you? What? See, we look at that and go, why would I do that? You would do that because that's what Jesus did. You would do that because that's a revolutionary, different, new way to treat people and to honor people and esteem other people. It's not really natural to us, and yet Jesus calls uh, us to it. And so the pattern, so the pattern of this new commandment is laying aside this uh, need for uh, to have prestige and rank and privilege and status. Now, the second part of this pattern is simply to look for practical uh, ways to help people. Practical deeds of helpfulness, we would call it. Just simply uh, decide you're just, you're just going to be a nice person and do stuff for people. And again, you're like, okay, that's not that earth shattering. Yeah, it is. So a few weeks ago, we were going to uh, an Angels baseball game. And uh, so we were, you know, in the, in the long line waiting to get in to the parking thing. And so I could see ahead that there were there looked like people walking down the lines, and they're like, oh, I'm thinking, I'm like, oh, these dudes are selling something. I really don't, I just annoys me, because I can't get away, and, you know, they're going to want me to buy something. So I'm like, okay, whatever they're selling, no, we're not buying it. I don't care what it is. Orphan kids, forget it. I don't care about orphan kids. I'm trying to get into the game, right? So this guy comes up. Windows down because I'm going to pay for my parking. He says, hey, I see you're driving a Honda. I go, "Uh, yes, I am. He goes, I'm a helpful Honda guy. We're paying for your parking today. It really happens, people. You were with me. That's exactly what happened, right? We were like, what? (laughs) That is so cool. And my wife, you know, she's everybody's best friend. She's like, oh, that's so great. Hey, where do you work? Do you work at Honda? What's your your wife's name? Are you free for lunch next week? You know, and I'm like, come on, honey, we got to get in there. Right. But it's like, what did I did not see that coming? And so in one way, Honda's brilliant for doing that. 
But the, and, and it's also why we love those online videos of people doing surprisingly simple but kind things for other people. Don't we? Oh, look at this video. This guy saw his neighbor's yard needed to be mowed and he mowed it. This, you know, on and on and on, right? We, we love those videos. This is what I'm suggesting. One of the reasons we love those videos and one of those reasons that we like, we love the helpful Honda guy, except for the fact I didn't have to pay $15 for parking. Practical. It's transactional. But in the heart of me, I'm like, this makes me feel good. Why? This is why. Because there is something about your divine nature that you, being in the image of God and your spirit and your soul there's something that cries for this this kind of self-giving kindness thing it's partly how God wired you and I think that's one one of the what reasons that we resonate with it we go that was so not like the world usually is it's so not like I usually think I'm just annoyed that people are annoying and they are annoying but our hearts are touched the fact is, the fact is, the early church following the pattern of Jesus to consider others before themselves, the pattern of this early church in the first decades and centuries of the church was so profound in how they loved one another, it literally created a revolution in the then known world. And between the time that Jesus establishes his church in the first century with 11 people, 12 because they voted another person on, right? And Jesus, this, this ragtag group of church people, and then this uh, leader who was killed as a criminal but resurrected in power, in less than three centuries, that revolution swept over the entire Roman Empire. You know why? And this is absolutely, absolutely recorded in uh, uh, what I would say non-Christian historians. So it's not just someone writing propaganda. You know, Roman historians, secular historians, they all, there were all these, uh, all, all these uh, references in history that there was something about these Christians that blew people's minds. And this is how they were described. We don't understand it. All we know is they love people. That was literally a revolution. In fact, there was a, there was a, 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 a widespread plague in the third century AD. And, and a, a lot of the so-called pagan in, in, in the cultures, uh, they, people were so afraid of um, catching the, the disease and dying, they were literally dumping their families in the gutters. They're like, we don't want to take, if there's any chance that, you know, you have the flu, we're dumping you in the gutter. We don't even care. There was no value. And so they literally were dumping people in the gutters for fear of catching the plague. This is recorded in history. It was the Christians who walked the streets and the gutters at risk of dying from the plague to love and care for sick people. Now we look at that and we go, wow, is and? No, no, that was revolutionary. They could not believe that there would be a people with no, nothing looking for in return except to care for people and to pursue good deeds. In fact, in the Roman world in the first century, it was legal and acceptable if you had a child and you just didn't want that child especially if it was a female child. It was perfectly fine. Just take it down to the river and kill it. Nobody cares. It was the Christian church who said, this cannot be and will not go forward. You just go through early history. It is the Christian church not looking for transaction, but esteeming others higher than themselves in the manner of Jesus, in the practical ways of loving one another and loving other people that literally changed the world. And Jesus said in John 13 and continues to say today, this is how the world's going to know you're my followers. Not so much that you believe all the right stuff, and I'm not against believing the right stuff, don't get me wrong. I believe we ought to have good theology and good doctrine and good, you know, understanding you know, about Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit and all that. I believe in, in, in all that. I, I can tell you this, though. Most people 
don't really want you to explain propitiation to them. They just want to know, they're just watching to see, do you love people? Do you honor people? It stands out so amazing. That's exactly what Jesus said was going to happen. It has not changed since Jesus first gave this command. In fact, even more so in our world today, which is so divided and so hateful and so divisive, that the church has the opportunity to stand up in a new and fresh way and love with a new commandment and be revolutionary in the same way. But then it's one thing to say to set ourselves aside and, and hold others up and do good deeds and all that, but there's still something that it's like, yeah, but how do I do that? Because, you know, honestly, most days I don't even like people. Really? I mean, some of you like people. You're weird. But most of us, you know, you know, people are annoying. Did I mention that before? So there's something in my core that's quite off. And that's just being honest as, try, as much as I try. And I, like I said, love is a commitment and it's a choice. But there's something more that needs to happen for this to truly be new and different that didn't exist before. We've got the example of Jesus, but there's got to be something else. So we have the manner of Jesus, but there's got to be something else. And that's the power of Jesus model. There's got to be something else that happens that's going to allow us and literally give us the capacity to step outside of ourselves and put and love other people above ourselves because it's not natural to us. And yet Jesus says that's what we are called to do. And so it's the Jesus as our power. And so it turns out that Jesus really kind of, again, models and explains what this is about. And really, the power of Jesus comes from, let's just say it this way, abiding, abiding in Jesus. The, the, the nearest, uh, closest um, parallel teaching on this, uh, loving one another in John, is, is a couple chapters later in the Gospel of John, where Jesus, again, in chapter 15, talks about um, the importance of love. But Jesus ties his abiding and, and uh, inseparable relationship with the Father in his ability to have power. Then he talks about um, his con uh, con connection to us and our connection to, to God. He uses the uh, teaching of the vine in John chapter 15. I am the vine, you are the branches, to teach us that there, we, we need to stay connected to the vine in order to have the life and the power. We all understand that as a wonderful teaching metaphor. What he's talking about is that uh, apart from staying connected, you can do nothing. That's exactly what Jesus says. Aside from abiding in me, you can do nothing. So he says, I'm commanding you to love. And then he's saying, but if you're not connected with me, you are not going to be able to do it. Here's the good news. I love to say this. God is not hiding from you. Jesus isn't telling you this is an, uh, an undecipherable mystery on how he simply says the key is to, is to get and stay connected to God, the abiding peace. He would say it this way in Acts chapter 1-8, right before he left. He says, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and the entire world. And so that presence of the Holy Spirit, that's the power, that's the ability, that's the changing. Now, I don't know, uh, we, were, we were singing a song. One of the songs we were singing in, when we were worshiping through song earlier in this hour was this idea of the change from the inside out, that something has changed, that there's a power, the resurrected Christ, the presence of the Holy Spirit. There's something that changes on the inside out that literally gives me the ability to be obedient to what Jesus is commanding me to be. Only on my own efforts, I am not going to be able to do it. Here's the good news. Jesus says, no, no, the power to do it comes from God, not only from your own efforts. The Apostle Paul would say it this way in that same wonderful chapter 2 of Philippians, uh, verse uh, 13, he makes the comment that that God is working in you, giving you both the desire and the power to do what God wants you to do. The desire and the power. This is hugely important. It's been one of my favorite verses for a long time because, you know, all kidding aside, uh, there are days when I'm like, I just don't, I don't want 
to love people. I don't want to be faithful. I don't want to do what God wants me to do. And some days, this is my prayer. God, you got to give me some want to. I don't have any want to today. And the promise of God's word is God is, this is what he said, God is at work in you to give you the want to as well as the ability to do it. See, there's something that has to happen to my basic core nature for me to step outside of myself in a consistent manner. And the good news is the abiding, that connection with God gives me both the want to and both the desire and the power to uh, do it. Oh, another, I'm not going to pull it out now, but another little thing I stuck on my phone to carry around with me this week was a little statement by uh, Oswald Chambers. I think, by the way, I found this on Facebook, so Facebook, Instagram, maybe, I don't know, it's someone's chat story or Snapchat or I don't know, I can't get it straight. Oswald Chambers says, look, as Christians, we get all about the do, the do, and the do. The doing, the doing, the doing. And I get that. We want to be busy. We want to be active. We want to do things for God. We want to do things for the church. Nothing wrong with that. He says, it would be far better if we forgot about the doing and focused on simply being in relationship with Jesus. If we simply said, I just need to hang out with Jesus more. I just need to know more about Jesus. I need to experience more about Jesus. Then the doing is a natural outgrowth of the being. See, who we are inside then will in fact show itself in the doing part. And in a busy doing world, we often make that uh, mistake. And so it's this the power of Jesus in order to, to fulfill this new command. It's a command, not a suggestion. We need some help. We need the power of God within us. Uh, Pastor Kyle messed with us uh, several sermons ago. It was a Sunday when, when I was here. And he messed with us when he said, did you know, it was kind of like that, did you know that you're on your phone, you can check on your apps and find out what percentage of time you are in, in all of your different apps. And I'm like, oh, busted. Right? And so I looked on mine to see you know, how my, what percentage of my time on my Bible app. It was like 98.5%. <laughs> then I was like, oh, no, wait, that was 0.9%. <laughs> Newman! Right? And so it was, a, it was a good thing, Pastor, you did. Because it was, a, it was a telling practical point. We can choose where we spend our time. And so um, most of us, to use that example, we're not abiding very, percentage-wise, we're not abiding very much in our relationship with God or God's Word. We're abiding elsewhere. We are most influenced by the people or the places or the influences where we spend the most time. Just let me sink, let, let that sink in. Psychologists have long confirmed that, uh, and this is one of the phrases, we, most, we are all the combined average of the five people that we spend the most time with. Right? Think about that. I'm, I've been thinking this week, I just want to make sure one of those five people for me is Jesus. Right? Because I am going to be under the influence of where I spend my time and in my relationships. And so this whole abiding thing, it's one of the, it's one of the areas where I can make a decision about my connections uh, with God and be under the influence. And by the way, uh, it was mentioned in the What's Up video, but right out here in, in, the, in the courtyard here, there are several opportunities to sign up and to be part of small groups. It's one of the greatest opportunities to be with other people in community, sharing some life together, sharing God's Word, and, and, and therefore t together abiding in our relationships uh, with God in our walks of faith. And by the way, those start right after next Sunday's big birthday deal, so the next, the following week. So, you know, just shameless plug to, like, if you're not in a small group, g give it a shot. Make that decision, right? Make that commitment of time and focus. Uh, because uh, the abiding piece is, is living according to uh, being in a relationship with God. And we could, you know, talk about, you know, the prayer, the fellowship, and so on. But I think you, we, we all understand that 
that where we spend our time is going to be the influence upon our lives. And simply put, the Scripture is very clear. The, the power to fulfill the new command comes literally from the spiritual reformation that happens to us when we get reconnected to God. Now there's one more how can this be possible statement. Right? Because it's, it's one thing to say, well, Jesus commands us to love as, as He has loved us. It means we got to set ourselves aside and not seek our own way and, and esteem others. We need to look for ways to be practically helpful. We need to try to... But, there, but there's, there's still one how can this be possible because in reality, we still have a, we still have a spiritual separation from God. Now, I, I say this often, and I never get tired of saying it, but if you know me, you know that I, I'm not big on, on uh, beating people up about being sinful. You pretty much know that already. See, that, I, that, that's, that's not a, a big deal as far as, as I'm concerned. We already know that something is amiss, but there is a deep and fundamental theological barrier standing between me and my relationship with God that will allow me to be faithful to the command of Jesus as a follower of Jesus. It's separation from God by sin. Sometimes theologians call it the wrath of God. Now, we don't like to talk about that. I don't like to talk about it, mostly because I think people misunderstand wrath as a strong, hurtful, hateful, emotional response, right? And say, well, you know, the wrath of God is on sinners. And we're like, oh, okay, so yeah, you're right. God's up there sitting on a throne, like throwing down thunderbolts, an angry old man with a white beard just waiting to bust us up, and like he's mad, he's just ticked off. Well, that's unfortunate that we think that because literally, theologically speaking, the wrath of God is simply the justice of God, God being perfect, and the sinfulness of humanity. And that separates us from God. And so theologically, it's called the wrath of God. In other words, sin is separating us from God. And until that sin problem, that wrath problem is taken care of, we aren't going to be able to make that connection. And if we can't make that connection, we can't follow through on the commandment. Are, are you with me on this? So one way to, to understand this, and this is what Jesus was saying when he said to his disciples, as, as soon as Judas left, he launched into the, it's about, it, it's, it's about time. Where I'm going, you can't go. And he began to tell them that the problem of sin and separation, that he, Jesus, was going to take that upon himself. What we did today with communion is, is one of the ways that God gives us to both remember and proclaim what the gospel is all about. Jesus, if you're familiar with Jesus' words, the Last Supper, he says, this bread is my body broken for you. This, this wine is my blood shed for you and offered as a sacrifice for sin to take care of the wrath problem, the separation of humanity from God. Galatians would say it this way, Christ redeemed us from the curse by becoming the curse for us. Or Ephesians and Colossians would say it this way, in Him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin in accordance with the grace of God. So you see that there's, there's a fundamental reconciliation that needs to happen with each of us. And until we come to that place where we understand that God in love and grace and Jesus, by choosing love and commitment, stood in my place so that I can have that relationship with God. We call that salvation. We call it the gospel. We call that grace. We call that forgiveness through the sacrifice of Jesus. Until that happens, really, it's theologically and practically impossible to follow this new command. And it's why we always want to be very, very clear when we meet, as we meet regularly at City Church, to make sure you understand this. God is not hiding from you. And the gospel is very clear. God loves humanity. That's what John said, that God so loved the world that Jesus himself offered to become the curse, to take care of the penalty for sin. And it's simply a matter of this, without beating anybody up, because we don't need to beat anybody up about it. 
all of us have sinned and we're separated from God until something happens about that. That connection back to our creator can't happen. That's what the gospel is about. We just want to be very clear all the time here at City Church that Jesus, the work of Jesus is already completed. You can't earn it. God doesn't want you to earn it. You couldn't anyway. But accept what God has, what Jesus has done on your behalf. That takes care of that separation problem. When that separation problem is taken care of, that connection to God happens. And that new ability to love like Jesus loved literally becomes more and more part of what we are able to do. And so if you're here today and you're just like, wow, I'm just not sure I've ever cleared that up. Again, the gospel is very straightforward. All God is desiring of you is to believe that you are loved. Sin has separated you from God. Believing that what Jesus did is sufficient for you to get back to God and receive that. And then God promises to forgive you. In other words, that separation is no more. To literally give you the Holy Spirit, which we already talked about. The ability to begin to live and be changed. To connect you to a community. Eventually, when you're, when you're finished with this old body, you know, don't, don't hurry up, people, because this body is a good thing. But eventually, when you're finished with it, you just you continue to live in perfect eternal life. That's what the good news is about. And when that happens, this revolutionary relational change happens where contrary to the natural tendency to not love, to not consider others, literally we began to be a witness for God because God changes us. And that is revolutionary in the world. I promise you, there is someone in your life and in your family, on your job, in your school, living across the street from you, in the gym that you go to, or whatever it is, that's watching you. If they know at all that you claim to be a follower of Jesus, they're watching you to see how you love and how you treat people and how you act. That's the way Jesus said it was going to be. How cool is that? That we simply commit ourselves to the manner of love that Jesus modeled and allow the power of God to help us do that. That's what we're called to do. Let's pray. God, only you know if there's even one person here today that uh, it, without being put on the spot just simply needs to admit that they've never completely understood or decided to accept your love and, and Jesus' sacrifice for them. And so even now... God, I I would pray that the the prayer in in the spirit of that person or persons is to say, God, I believe you love me. I accept what God, Jesus has done. I want to be part of your family. And I want you to come into my life. I want to be a follower of yours. For many more of us, and God, this is me. This is me and many of us here. God, I, I, I want to live my life in such a way that people are not impressed with all the theology I know, but wonder who in the world I serve And what happened to me that I would love people as Jesus loved me? May that be so. In the powerful name of Jesus, amen.